have to tell you that we could have had 300 people join us today. And this is kind of our introductory to kind of figure out if this kind of works or it doesn't work. I see uh, some people's glasses fogging up. You may have to take those glasses off just for a little bit and kind of figure out if what, what works and what doesn't work. My glasses don't work, so I'm going to take these off. Jai, how are you? So, uh, again, as I said, we could have had lots of people join us today, but uh, we, we wanted you to come. And this is kind of, our, our, kind of our kickoff to our season. Remember, we have the Old Capitol Conference coming up here in October. James will talk a little bit ab about that, too. But, again, we're all at this meeting to kind of learn. And because we're all wearing masks, it looks like we're at a bank robbers convention. So thanks for being here at the bank robbers convention. So before I, I kind of get it going, I want to see, is Darwin here? Yeah. So the purpose of this is really to kind of explain a little bit about what Darwin's doing with this space. And so I want to give him a little bit of time to have him explain what he's doing and how you could possibly take advantage of this space. So Darwin, can you come up here and talk a little bit about what's going on? I can't hear you. Oh, telephones, yeah, please silence your phones, too, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, here's Darwin. All right, thank you and welcome. Like I said, this is our inaugural outside event. We did do a four-day budget boot camp for all of our managers, and that was the only other time we've had people in the room. But uh, we invested a whole lot in this space, in this building, so that we can provide you. You see three cameras. That white thing looks like an upside-down R2-D2, and in the middle and over on this other side. So they're all 4K cameras so that we can record everything. The remote control from our control center over behind this window. We can record podcasts already set up to go ahead and do that. And this is available to everybody. And that's what we wanted to do. We've always done free training and uh, we're gonna continue to do that for, uh, for whoever wants to learn about real estate. And we do feed them with a fire hose, you know, give them all the information. If they wanna invest, great. So I don't see us as, obviously we're competitors when we're trying to get a deal, but as far as the money out there, it's all out there. So if you want to use the room, um, we do rent out the room. And if you want to have partner meetings, if you needed to do any of that, if you wanted to record it, we've got our all of our AV guys and equipment that can handle any of that for you or podcasts or anything else you want to do. So this is available for rent to, that you guys can go ahead and use. Um, this building, just to give you an idea, we're real estate syndicators, right? So we bought this building and syndicated the deal and raised money for it so that we can have space like this for our management company and our uh, all of our acquisitions, et cetera. So I want to thank you for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to let us know. That's fantastic. Again, he's not doing the training, but I would think that what you would want to do is if you did not have space, you could use this space to hold an investor meeting here or the ability to raise capital if you don't have a space and you could have it recorded. I think that may be something to, to consider uh, when we start raising capital on these deals. I can tell you that we're very busy right now and we're busy because I think the market has changed. And so the order of events that we're going to kind of do today is we're going to have some of our, our guys talk a little bit about multifamily and the broker perspective. And so I want to have you guys, you know, we're all on the same team today. We're all talking about business. And so today we're going to have three of the top um, brokers here in the, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We're going to have Nick Flewellen. He's going to speak first. Then we're going to have Jacob Anderson. Uh, I call him Ernest Hemingway. He just got back from sailing in Denmark last week. So he'll take off his mask and he'll, he'll, he'll look just like Ernest Hemingway. And then, then finishing up is going to be Chris B.A. with CBRE. So we're excited to have these three guys kick it off. And so they'll talk for about... Uh, everyone will talk about 15 minutes. We want to kind of hear what their perspective is and maybe what their company's perspective is of just not only Dallas and Texas, but also the nation nation piece. And we just want to get a little bit of more information about what's going on. This is the first time that all of us have been together. So let's just be very careful with that. The person that is the is, is the winner of having the most effort today of making it, I'm going to have to say, is Win Yu. Win just had a baby last week. So congratulations on her. So Ken and Wynn are brand new parents for number two. So that is fantastic. So good for them. 
So uh, again, we're we're gonna have Nick speak. We'll have Jacob speak. We'll have Chris speak, and then we'll all get together and we'll kind of do a little fireside chat because we want to hear what some of your questions are, and then we'll ask those questions at that period of time of what uh, the perspective is. So James will jo uh, join me up on stage, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about what's going on too in a bigger perspective. So, but without further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to Nick. All right. Well, Paul was making me nervous because he was standing on this top part. Um, and I was worried he was going to trip and fall, so I'm going to stand on this bottom part here. All right, there we go. Well, uh, first of all, Darwin, thanks for uh, having us uh, here. What an awesome, awesome facility. Definitely a blessing just to, to get to use this for real estate purposes. Am I on mic on? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's great to be here, and I miss seeing all you guys. It's great to, to be in person again doing something, so... Uh, and then when we walked in today, you know, David Tuttle back there who works with Darwin and Chris and I all kind of circled up and we all worked together at Marcus and Millichap back in 2004, 2005. So we had a little reunion and, and told old war stories. So anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to, uh, to get to reminisce about uh, the old days. And, you know, someday we're all going to be looking back, talking about what we're going through right now, thinking, oh, gosh, remember all those crazy times. So, um, you know, the, the theme, I guess, today is, you know, with COVID and what's going on in the market, we haven't seen uh, real pricing discounts. Uh, and so kind of what's going on, where do we go from here, and, and kind of what have you seen? So what I thought I would do is just touch on a couple of, of macro things and then kind of narrow the focus down to multifamily. I think what's happened in some of the other product types uh, has, has made for some interesting things in the multifamily world as well. And so... Just a couple of quick comments. The, the first bullet up there is, is overgeneralizations lead to missed opportunities. I think the, the narrative in the media, certainly initially, and, and, and look, I think probably all of us had some fear associated with what this was gonna look like for our business. But, um, you know, a lot of properties are lost causes and oh, this deal's gonna go down into the dumps. Um, and, and I think what we saw for the most part is that hasn't been the case. Uh, a lot of uh, sectors have been hard hit, but uh, a lot of them have held up strong, including thankfully ours, you know, which, which being the multifamily business and then specifically multifamily business in, in DFW. So that, that's been positive so far. I think some of the trends that have, have changed over the last few months are creating new demand drivers moving forward. Um, I think a lot of the high density uh, areas, even in, and I say this nationally, high density cities, We've certainly seen people leaving those cities or make plans to leave those cities um, in, you know, in search of, of maybe opportunities elsewhere. And then I think even on the, the local level, some of the high density areas, some of the high density communities, you're seeing residents say, hey, you know, maybe I want to shift out and, and go more out to the suburbs, not just in the multifamily space, but also office space with uh, the work from home uh, capability that we never knew that we have always had. Um, and, and now everybody's kind of become an expert on, on working from home. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think that's created some different opportunities and, and, and trends moving forward. And it'll be interesting to see if people buy bigger homes, people rent bigger apartments to, to have you know, space to potentially work as, uh, as we move forward here. You know, and, and I would just say, as, as in our office, we've got guys doing all different product types, and, and I'm talking to these guys daily. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there. I have seen some multifamily people even looking at, at some other uh, asset classes. Industrial specifically has been interesting, um, but, but you do have, um, you know, opportunities maybe that, that you never have looked at before. And so I would just encourage you guys to, to, to kind of look at different uh, possibilities. And, you know, as far as hotels, of course, the initial thought was, oh, that whole market's going to just be destroyed, and it's been hit hard. But if you went to Florida this summer, Seaside or Destin or whatever, there's not a room to be had there. If you went to Broken Bow, there's not a room to be had or a house to be rented anywhere around there. Colorado, there's not a room to be had or a room, you know, to be rented or a house to be rented. So, you know, I think there, uh, it's, it's too simplistic to say, oh, okay, this whole sector's been hit hard. And so I would just say, there's opportunities and that that's the same in multifamily you know certain areas or certain properties have been hit hard i think there's going to be some opportunities uh, as a result of that and i'll, I'll touch on that just uh, briefly in a moment uh, this uh this graph over uh, to your right is just a uh, a graph that we monitor really you know frequently and it's really the the spread between the average cap rate and the 10-year treasury 
And, and what you see, the wider that spread is, is, is generally a, a significant indicator of, of the buying window and opportunity. And if you look historically speaking for the last 20 years, you know, it's about as wide as it's ever been, you know, in late 2011, 2012, it, we also had a pretty big spread there, but that, that's a pretty powerful uh, graphic. And again, it just should be encouraging that, hey, I can actually still find deals and, and be able to make money right now. There you go. So uh, a, a couple of uh, quick bullet points here, just as far as, as the multifamily world goes. I think, you know, obviously collections exceeded everybody's expectations. That was a big sigh of relief when we saw that first month come in and okay, people actually paid. Okay, and then everybody worried about the next month and then people paid again and so forth. And it's, it's continued to be that way and people have started to go back to work and, and uh, be rehired and people brought in off of furlough. Uh, it's not over by any means yet, but um, I think that's, um, I, I think uh, there's a concern at this point in time that a lot of, uh, you know, the federal benefits that we have, and, and, and I was just talking with a couple of folks this morning about this, but uh, the, the federal benefits were, were propping the economy up. Those benefits, as, as those benefits go away, um, you know, you, uh, you could see collections start to erode a little bit. Obviously, what we learned yesterday is the eviction moratoriums uh, now through the end of the year. Um, we have that now, so, so now we have strings uh, attached to operations, but we don't have any federal aid at this point. I would certainly think that's coming, but as of right now, all we have is, is the downside, and we don't have any, uh, any uh, comfort and, and relief for some of these folks that don't have jobs. So I think we're gonna see the state unemployment benefits um, driving uh, and dictating kind of what the headwinds are moving forward. We're fortunate again to be in Texas. Um, when you look at uh, the DFW unemployment rate, we're at about 12% right now. Average rent uh, across uh, the Metroplex is about uh, almost 1200 bucks. The state max uh, of unemployment benefits almost 2100 bucks. So you have a delta of about $900. Uh, that is one of the highest in the country um, as far as so uh, as far as that delta goes. So again, uh, if you're looking nationally, and I think a lot of decisions on the federal level are going to be made based on what the national uh, outlook is, we're in really good shape here. And again, if we get some more federal aid, hopefully collections are not really uh, going to um, erode too much uh, in, in the coming months. You also have an election, which generally historically leads to a little bit of volatility or a little bit of uncertainty in the marketplace. We've never had an election with this type of pent-up demand to get money out there. And so I think everything we think we know, uh, everybody's kind of not so sure we know this year. So, so I think that's interesting. I think just from a fundamental standpoint, you know, uh, the multifamily sector slightly regressed in Q2. I don't think that's a big surprise. Vacancy moved up a little bit. I think uh, how that flows into our underwriting right now from a broker standpoint and probably from a principal standpoint is it's hard to, um, it's hard to uh, basically model rents growing too much right now because you're, you're going to be forced to probably do quite a few uh, renewals that are going to be flat just to kind of keep everybody uh, happy and you're certainly not going to be real aggressive in pushing people out right now. And so, I, you know, doesn't mean that there's not value add deals. That, that was one thing when this whole thing started. I was wondering, is the value add strategy going to be even a viable thought for people as they're buying deals? I think what we have seen is, yes, it still is a viable thought. If there's other comps in the market getting these higher rents, people are still underwriting saying, OK, I'm not trailblazing here and, and coming up with some plan that is, is crazy. I can still quantify these rents going to be at this level if I do this work. What we're not seeing is people saying, I'm going to model 4.5% rent growth here organically, um, at, at least not in, in year one right now, uh, which I, I, I think makes sense unless you just feel like you're way, way, way under market. So um, with all that said, what, what's going on uh, in, in our team business right now? Um, and I just thought I'd share with you guys a, a couple of things that we're doing. For one, I think, the, you know, like Paul said, they're very busy right now. We're very busy right now. Um, in fact, the faucet feels like it's been turned on full blast. We have a ton of deals in escrow right now. Uh, almost every deal that we had die because of COVID has been revived and, and has either already made it to the finish line or is, is in process of going to the finish line. So that's been, that's been a good thing. 
we have five large deals in DFW that we're launching here uh, in the next probably three weeks. Um, and, and so any, anything from 127 units to 372 units, we've, we've got some, uh, some, some big assets. We also have some 75 unit under deals, a number of those we're launching. And then one of the things that we've done during COVID, um, which, which I, I'm really, really excited about moving forward is we've made a huge push uh, into the secondary mar and tertiary markets. Um, and so we've, we've hired five guys over the, over the course of uh, these last five months. And really what we're trying to do is find opportunities outside of DFW. As many of you have, have said, um, hey, it's hard to find deals here that make sense. Um, writing a lot of offers, but I'm not getting any to the finish line. We're, we're trying to find opportunities, maybe a lower basis, uh, you know, areas that have fewer upgrades. It's hard to find something in Dallas that hasn't been upgraded fairly substantially. It's not impossible, um, but, but it's, it's not easy. We have one of these deals uh, of the five up top that has had fairly minimal interior upgrades done. So that's gonna be a, a fun one to, to see. But lower basis, uh, less upgrades. Uh, a lot of these markets are less impacted by COVID. Uh, and, and, and if you go visit some of them, you, you, you may say that I didn't even realize that there is a virus uh, going right now. I mean, it, it's operations and business as usual. And I'm, and I'm not just talking about East Texas, West Texas, Central Texas, I'm talking about the whole region. So all the surrounding states around uh, as well. And so again, some of those states haven't really been hit that hard. And, and, and the last thing I would say is most of these deals are, are, uh, and markets are agency debt eligible. So you get all the benefits of great financing, um, but you have all the benefits of a lower basis, rents that aren't really that much lower than DFW, and, and more upside because a lot of these units haven't been upgraded. So, I would say, looking forward, the, uh, the market uh, and, and, and the investor uh, sentiment is positive. But um, you know, what's challenging, I would say, right now is some of these old assumption deals, um, which, are, which are a lot of times are great deals. But 5% you know, interest rate, 5.2% interest rate, we've got one right now. We've got a ton of activity on it, but it's just hard to get people excited right now when you, have, you can go get a I think we got a quote the other day from you guys that 295, you know, I mean, that's, uh, that's a big, big, big delta. Some of those deals are amortizing already. 295 with interest only. I mean, it's a, it's a major swing in, in your financials. So I would say that's probably the biggest challenge. Uh, but, but as far as appetite, we're seeing record numbers of, of confidentiality agreements being signed. Less tours, which makes sense because people don't want to go out unless they, they really, uh, you know, love the deal and want to see it. Um, but, but overall activity is good and we're getting these deals across the finish line and, and obviously people are ready to, to kind of launch and, and, and move forward. So um, I know we'll have some questions at, at the end. We want to wait and do those or? Any questions at the end? Okay, all right. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Anderson here. Great to see everyone. Actually, my first slide, uh, I, I was thinking about, you know, the email I got from Paul and coming here, and I said yes within 20 seconds because I want to do it. I haven't been doing this for a while, and I called it still alive, question mark. And my wife gave me a hard time and said, still alive, is that right? She said, well, I feel alive, actually, to go out and do this kind of stuff again. So thank you so much, Paul, for actually putting this on and, and make this kind of happen. And to some of the points that, that Nick made, we've gone through a time here, starting, let's call it in the beginning of March, mid-March. Um, on the macro level, we had uh, immediate concerns about the market. Um, employment, where are we gonna be? Um, um, I should probably pull it up so I can see my notes at least here. Sorry, guys. Um, that, that was probably the biggest one. Uh, we, had a de uh, we had a deal that was set to close mid-March and uh, the, the lender called and said, look, we're close to business. We were ready, everything ready, all docs ready to go. Just close to business. They, they couldn't do any deals, they were on, on, on complete hold. So at that point, my job changed from being actually a broker, going out, doing tours, doing best and finals to more of a data collector and saying, okay, what is the thing? What, how do we get to the next point here? Um, so what we focused on 
from March going forward into April to May was really data collecting, talking to you guys, talking to everyone, talking to lenders, feeling out the rhythm of, of the market. And we have, quite frankly, been pretty f fortunate here. Um, it took about three months where it was nothing was really happening. You could feel that people were still interesting, interested in doing real estate, especially multifamily. As Nick mentioned, there, were, uh, there have been big concerns about hotels. Some of that, that has been mitigated now. Um, so having said that, coming in on the other side, we're looking at unemployment. Yes, it's not as good as it was in February. We are down on our numbers. However, when we look at the national average and looking at the bigger metro areas, we are actually doing really, really well in comparison to some of these areas. So again, DFW showing that it's holding up versus other alternatives. Equity, that's probably the other ones, and that's as much your guy's job, and that's what I've talked to a lot of people. How is it to raise equity? We had a deal that was caught right in, the, actually, the seller sitting right there uh, in, 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 um, in COVID, and the fundraising was going on right in the middle, and, and it was tough. Um, but they, they went through it, they got it done, um, but it took some time, again, to spread kind of that data and say, okay, it's not as bad as we thought. The occupancy is not going to be 60% across the board. People will still, still pay. So coming here today, where we're see is, is, uh, what we're seeing is on the macro level, let's call it employment, it's not as bad. And actually DFW in comparison to a lot of other areas is doing really well. We're looking at debt. Obviously, the interest rates right now, they are very advantageous. Um, that helps tremendously, but they are really also bullish of getting stuff done. Uh, the green program is back, for example. So that piece works. Now you're looking at, seven, say, 70 to 80% of the capital stack that's very active. Now equity comes on board and is active and want to take advantage of, of this situation. So to tie it back to what we saw, let's call it March 1st, pricing, terms, whatnot, we are more or less back to it. Not with the same exact fundamentals, because as Nick also mentioned, the value add, for example, the lender started to ask for escrows. In the beginning, it was a huge amount. Now they have kind of dissected down to what is actually important, what's not. So that has been lessened that burden. However, what you're seeing now is a lot of people are going in with uh, with uh, execution and saying, okay, we're not gonna go in day one because the, the, the functionality on going into a unit and with COVID and whatnot, it, 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 it makes it more difficult. So, oh, there we are. Thank you. So that's basically what we talked about in the beginning of, of some of the concerns. Um, um, as mentioned, some site visits, due diligence, for example. How are we gonna do it? It's great that we award you the deal if you can't get into any units, the office is closed, how are we gonna do it? Th those were all questions. Um, so how does it look now? We talked about the unemployment, the debt market, and the equity, kind of the macro parts of the business. And oh, um, Then the occupancy bad debt, that was the big thing, the big, the big item what we were tracking, how are deals actually doing? We have had a couple of deals in the beginning, it was tough. You could see some people, uh, I think it was as much, you know, it could, <laughs> they were looking for any reason to, to say, hey, I'm not gonna pay you. And you saw that coming out. But actually after a couple of months here, whoops, keeps jumping. Okay. After a couple of months, um, it actually showed up that, that some deals, they were, they were actually doing better. We have a deal that we are, we are about to put in escrow and you're looking at the trend on, on the deal and, and throughout COVID, it, it, uh, it has actually increased its, its performance. Um, due diligence and site visits. Now, I think we have all found the rhythm. It is not picture perfect, but for us, we're putting two parties together both with different expectations of how things should go down. I think there is a more of a feeling that, hey, we're willing to work with you. I know it's not gonna be ideal. We might not be able to see all units when we go out on a site, but we'll make it work. So 
We spend a little more time kind of mapping that piece out in the transactions, but what we saw now, or what we see now in comparison to, in, let's say, March and April, uh, we have it overall between management groups and owners and, and buyers, there's a better uh, grasp on, on how to actually take down the deal and doing just the, the site inspections, the lease file audits, whatnot. So I, I brought a couple of case studies up here. A couple of deals in uh, various stages. So uh, Adelita Townhomes, that is a deal um, that we had on the market before COVID. When we hit March, we were right there with the offers. Everything was going great, and we were, uh, but at that point, everyone was just at a standstill, couldn't do anything. We obviously advised and say, look, we can continue to press this, but I don't think it really would behoove anyone. So let's give it some time. And here, um, a month, month and a half ago, you're going to start to see the 1031 guys popping up because they have still been in the pipeline and they still need their up leg. So they, they have been very, very active now to come into the market. Um, and it was taken down by, um, oh, wow, this, is, this is not really working well for me. <laughs> Anyways, I'll just continue to talk. So Adelita, it got done. And actually, when you're looking at the pricing, and I like to use the case studies instead of just talking about, you know, hey, that's the trend. But when we're looking at it, apples to apples, a deal like that, it actually sold for more. It had hard money. It had all the function, functionalities of an offer we would see in, in March or in February. The next one is Regal Crossing. That's a workforce housing deal in Dallas. Uh, we are about to bring out. It's a good example of, I don't have any stats of the tours or whatnot, but it is a good example of a deal that's actually doing better than before. Um, it is, it, it, it is continues its, its positive trend. And now you have a deal where um, the debt is obviously helping out. We will, we will be underwriting, let's call it a four, 450 back in February, March. Now we're underwriting around a 3%. Um, so that's a huge swing in, in in, in, um, in uh, returns for, for new investors. And the last one is one we are working on right now, and I put that up really in place. It's the middle of the fairway, 1985 asset uh, in North Dallas. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that um, I think we have been more selective on tours. And again, to Nick's point, uh, we, we see record amounts of CAs coming out. Um, people are a little more selective on, on the tours and coming out. However, we're, we've seen 30 tours. We have offers due here uh, coming up, uh, what is it, next week? And um, we've seen a ton of uh, uh, activity on that. And again, some of the stuff I, I attribute to that is, we are in DFW, we are in Texas, the market is good. And overall, what really shines through is, we are a really good alternative to other solutions. We might not be the best right now, we are also hit by COVID, but it's better than New York, it's better than San Francisco, it's better than the stock market. So um, we're seeing that pressure from out of town groups and all, obviously also from the IRS pushing the 1031 uh, timeline to July 15th. And we have seen a lot of people now coming out and have to identify. So that has really pushed it. People want to, there is some, some, some um, worries about the election. Where are we going to go um, on, on, um, on some of these items? So I think that this window here, that has obviously pushed some, some, uh, some of this activity. Now, uh, to Nick's point too, um, the one thing that we have out there is the government programs that have, that have helped tremendously to pay rent. What's happening now if it completely goes away? How much are we actually by ourselves holding up? That is the one unknown. But again, the important part I think is that's something we can't really control. It is what it is. But how are we sitting here on let's say a multifamily investment in, in comparison to other asset classes? And my conclusion from what we have seen since March until now is, is really holding up. Um, and with that said, I'm done.
Well, I was just, it, it's interesting. I stand up here and this is the first time I've, I've spoken in front of anybody with the masks and I was gonna say, it's good to see a bunch of familiar faces, but instead I'll just say, it's good to see a bunch of familiar eyes and, and hopefully that works, you know? Um, but just, but following these two gentlemen and how they spoke and they presented and all that, I, I could easily say ditto and, and walk off and that'd be the end of the presentation. But I, as I reviewed my slides this morning before I came up here, there's kind of this underlying theme on this whole thing that everybody's, and when, when Paul called and said, hey, you know, what, what now? We've had COVID, now what? And as I look at the, all my slides, I'm thinking it's very easy for everybody uh, to get very myopic, very myopic in the next six months, what I'm gonna, what, what, what's gonna happen, what's going on? And as I look at the slides and see the trends and the research and all that stuff, everybody in the room here kind of was selected for this presentation because everybody has has bought and sold. You guys have been active. You guys are are kind of ensconced in in multifamily DFW real estate. It's you want to have that a little more chin up kind of horizon looking kind of concept because, like Jacob said, we could be in Cleveland, we could be in Cincinnati, we can be in Oklahoma City, we can be in you know anywhere else pretty much in the country, even even Manhattan in the five boroughs. But we're in Dallas Fort Worth, and for however you got here it's good you're here versus somewhere else. So it, it's just, as I go through my slides, be thinking that in the back of your head. Um, I wanted to start out kind of high level and then get pretty myopic into Dallas-Fort Worth and certain submarkets, but um, you know, there's still this underlying theme of going forward where we're always gonna have renters, and I think that's even increasing just because uh, you've got younger folks that are delaying marriage and families You've got uh, empty nesters that are moving back into to rental properties. Um, and a lot more people just like the flexibility. And I struck out the, the third one there because this was a, a presentation that I gave on March 10th in San Jose, California, this slide. And I showed up in the, and it was very similar to this. Um, and I was out there with my family uh, for spring break, and I said, well, let me go down there, I'll give a presentation to some investors down there in, in Silicon Valley. So I show up, and that is the day that Google announced, uh, pretty much at 11 o'clock in the morning, all their 20,000 employees, please go home, COVID is rampant, Work, start working from home. And so that kind of rippled throughout all of Silicon Valley, and there were supposed to be 60 people in the audience that day, and it ended up being like 15. So the room was, was you know, just a couple of people in this huge room, but, but I wanted that slide to be on there because the urban living concept is really in question as we go forward here. Now, what, what is that? I think Nick would uh, relate to that. The other, the other point I wanted to point out was over the past you know, years, student uh, debt has just gone through the roof. The average amount of student debt now is $35,000 that a student is graduating with. So for him to rent an apartment and they go, let me go buy a house and do that, it, it, everything is just being delayed. And, and it's like two thirds of the students that are graduating have some sort of student debt. So it, that does weigh heavy on decisions going forward in your 20s. Uh, so now we get into more of Texas. And, and this was a, I saw this and I said, well, let me, let me put that up there. And it's kind of hard to see, but you guys, you know, we've got Texas, but then they've renamed all the other states. And um, I was actually going up to uh, Colorado a couple of weeks ago, and I saw say, somebody from Texas, and this is on a t-shirt, so this is not me saying this, but it said the United States equals Texas and it's 49 bitches. <laughs> and, and so this is a, a good segue into to how we look at Texas and in regards to rental growth and everything else. This is all from 2019, but I wanted to point this out, that of all the investments, $24 billion in the US in multifamily was invested in Texas in the four me major metros. So you're looking at, at 24 mil billion went into that. That equals 14% of the entire United States investing in multifamily was in Texas. If you look at that a different way, every unit that sold, one of those in six was in the four major metros. So that's including Miami, LA, everything else, one in six, 18, roughly 14 to 18% was in the four major metros. So, I mean, having that type of, of language and attraction on a national level, everybody is now focusing on Texas. 
So, and then if you break that down even more, and the slide's messing up a little bit, but it shows the amount of the 24 billion broken out by the four major metros. This, this big square is Dallas-Fort Worth, 10.5 billion. So it's about 41% of everybody investing in the four major metros are investing in Dallas-Fort Worth. So it's, and I think that's the highest number of any particular metro in the, in the entire nation that people are investing. Uh, so then we even get a little more myopic. So this is pretty current research until June, uh, getting into the pre-COVID, post-COVID environment. What we're looking at is how the decline, you know, it, it obviously spiked and then has trickled down. But you see Austin, DFW, San Antonio, and Houston have all significantly lower unemployment rates than the rest of the nation on average. And it's declining. And the strongest one is Dallas-Fort Worth. So then how do, how do we go forward from here? This is a, an analysis of, I think, 42 of the largest major metros, and I tried to make the, the, the four major metros in, the, in Texas larger so you can see it. But how, the, always the question is, how quick are we gonna recover from, from this? And in regards to that job growth, that, that, that what everybody relies on in regards to employment as well as filling up the apartment units, beds and uh, heads on beds, is, Dallas and Austin are pretty much right there at a year and a half. Yeah, that sounds like a long time, 18 months, but if you're staring at, you know, I mentioned Cleveland earlier, Chicago, Philadelphia, I mean, they're, they're almost four years before they're gonna recover in the type of job growth that they're going for. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, it looks ugly and bad, but we're, we're in the location that is ideal to be investing in multifamily going forward. And I also want to just point this out. So from 2008 to 2018, how have we seen, I know it's a little historical, but I've got future graphs that show this. We've seen a consistent population growth throughout Texas of 3.6 million uh, in the four major metros uh, up till that time. But then if you project it out, let's, let's keep our chins up and let's look at what, what we're investing in. Obviously it's not right now in the next six months, but going forward over the next 12 years, you're looking at another 1.4 million people in DFW. That on average is about one and a half percent population growth for the next 12 years. So then we, then we just dig in a little bit into the, to the growth rate, the overall growth rate. And if you look on that, Dallas is number three for the people in the back. And Dallas is by far the number one population growth going forward. And this is, this is in the next 12 months, year over year. It's a little dated, so this is like, middle of 2019 to 2020. So this does not take into COVID, but hang on, there's more slides. So you're seeing, I mean, a substantial amount of growth compared to all these other ones. But then the next five years, going from 2018 to 2030, they're projecting on average, uh, um, you know, about 700,000 people moving here. So, and that is by far the fastest and the, and the largest list, Houston's number two, and then you go into the larger metros of Phoenix and New York. But, but again, we're looking, you know, chin up kind of projections of how are we gonna do this if we wanna invest for the future, we're, we're in the right spot going forward. This, I mean, I, I'm probably a little opinionated, but I honestly think in regards to investing in multifamily, you know, for the past 10, 20 years, and you're gonna be doing it for the next 10 or 20 years, what we're witnessing here is literally just, in my opinion, a speed bump on the road to success. Uh, in my, just little old me. Um, the other drivers that are people are studying like this is when you see major corporate relocations coming here. I mean, you've got Charles Schwab up in, in Richardson, Uber. They're in the Epic, they're in Deep Ellum. They're bringing a, uh, they call it Uber HQ2. They're bringing a thousand, uh, sorry, 3,000 employees in the next three years, each one making about $100,000. So this is not your entry level kind of stuff. This is mid-level corporate you know, white collar college educated folks that are relocating here. And then you've got the PGA headquarters all the way up there, almost at 380 and, and the toll road um, being developed. They're, they're moving here from Florida. So you're seeing still a lot of long-term attention for development and growth in this area. So now, now if we, a little more projecting going forward, this is uh, the end of June's 
analysis for, for second quarter 2020, and it's categorized just by the, the name of the city. So Austin is not technically in third place, but it's just, it starts with an A. But you can see, I've bolded them up, but you're seeing the projections. And this is, so this would be end of June 2020 through June of 2021 is, let's say, let's just marry Dallas and Fort Worth together. You're looking at 26,000 units coming online. Um, and the absorption rate is going to be around 18. So it's going to be a little soft going forward, uh, which you can see all the way to the right that your vacant, your, um, your rent growth is going to be a little bit challenging for the next 12 months. They're showing it as, as being a little more of a negative. But again, if you look forward for the next five years, and this is uh, organized by um, uh, uh, number of units coming online. So you got three of the major metros in Texas in the top five. But what, what I mean, that looks kind of scary. It's like, okay, that's a lot of units coming online. But if you start to go to the right, you see under vacancy, our, you know, our, our vacancies are, you know, let's call it five and 6%, but the impact, except Houston, I, I think a lot has to do with the price per barrel and that kind of stuff. You're not seeing much of an impact on the vacancy, even with this growth that's coming in. And then all the way to the right, you're seeing the same store rent growth still in the twos for the next five years. So, and this is the end of June. So this is taking into the impacts from COVID. Uh, so I want to just show this scattergram. So this is de digging even, deep, even deeper into it. So these are submarkets just for Dallas Fort Worth. So where you want to be is in the upper left hand corner, positive rent growth, decreasing vacancy. Lower right is not where you want to be. Uh, vacancy increasing and rent declining. So you look at most of us in here, I think all of us in here are more BC investors, developers, value add type of folks. And you're looking at a lot of that uh, space that I think we all look at if a deal comes on the market, Mesquite, uh, Grand Prairie, uh, North Arlington, uh, those kind of areas. Then in the lower right, those are a little more of the flashy kind of uh, shiny object kind of deals that we've been looking at for the past four or five years. Uptown, the medical district near Parkland, downtown Fort Worth, um, Oak Lawn, Park Cities, you know, that kind of very in, in, infill location that Everybody wants to be around where the developers are developing, but you're seeing that's where, the, that's also the highest density of folks too. So I think the COVID is having an impact on, on hey, where do I wanna live? And I think a lot of people are looking towards the suburbs a little more. So it, just like Jacob did, I wanted to give one case study in regards to the signed CAs and, and the level of interest of, of buyers. And what we're seeing since COVID is that when we put a deal out on the market, let's say it's a B asset, or let's say it's an A, let's say it's a C asset. Um, we're used to having C investors look at it. Well, since COVID, now we're seeing B and C investors look at a C asset. It, it seems like everybody's box has just gotten bigger. So if, if somebody has traditionally been buying class A kind of product, 2000s and newer, all of a sudden they're looking at the 80s vintage stuff, even tax credit stuff, even deals in marginal neighborhoods. They're, you can tell they're really exploring, hey, I've got all this pent up money that, that uh, Nick and Jacob have mentioned. And, and I, yeah, the amount of capital chasing the deals is, is significant, but they've got to place that capital. And what we're witnessing also is you have that conversation where Hey, I've got this fund. Um, I'm looking for you know normal IRRs, cap rates, cash on cash, kind of that type of thing. But then you also have these folks that, when COVID hit, they would they would create a vulture fund, and they would think, okay, this is 2008, this is 2009. I am teed up. I am ready to go in and buy stuff at 60 cents on the dollar. Well, that never happened. So all of a sudden, they still have this vulture fund with millions and millions of dollars in there. And now they're all putting it into one fund and go, okay, well, we got to place the money. So all of a sudden you have this big, large capital uh, chasing fewer deals that are, on, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So um, I want to just point out kind of the pre-COVID and post-COVID. This is uh, two different two packs that we had on the market, uh, both out in the suburbs, 80s vintage, over 200 units combined. It was, it was very similar. One was pre-COVID. 
Um, and we, you know, we marketed it and then it, and we got it awarded and then COVID hit, the deal fell apart and all that kind of stuff. So that was, you know, kind of your normal in the box type of purchaser looking at that deal. And we averaged three signed CAs a day. And this is not completely scientific, but I'm a broker, not a scientist. So work with me. And then the post COVID, this was a deal we launched, um, not the same set of deals, but two story garden style walk up. It was in the suburbs same resident profile, same rent per foot area. Um, the level of interest on that was almost double. We had just under six signed CAs a day while we were marketing that asset. And if you look at that list of who signed the CAs, it's very much not just your typical B-class buyer, but you had A and C product buyers looking at these deals. And um, it, it's it's... I mean, you can really see the impact of it. The amount of phone calls, the amount of emails that we receive is, is significant. So not really in conclusion, but I, I wanted to make some, just some key points here. Most of the deals we're seeing, you know, the, the T12 that we're analyzing, you're seeing recently the T12 kind of dipping. So the T1 is not as strong annualized as if you annualize the T12. But what is, has impacted that and, and driven, I think, motivated a lot of buyers is that darn low interest rate. I mean, that is historically low. And like Jacob said, it, you know, if, if we're at 3% and the green program has all of a sudden, you know, popped its head up again and everybody's chasing that thing. And, you know, I mean, you can really get sub three IO in, uh, interest rates. That's, gr that's great opportunity. So what that is doing a little bit when people are still looking at the same cash on cash, hey, I need, you know, an 8% cash on cash year one they're looking at the cash on cash. So as long as their debt service is less, they can still achieve that. So it, even though we've had lower NOIs, the cap rates have not, you haven't seen that COVID correction or adjustment or uh, impact. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, large amounts of equity in the market. I, it's the most, I'm doing this 20 years, this is probably the most amount of money that I've seen chasing deals. Uh, deals on the market. So at least in our shop, a lot of deals are getting off market and not like the old way of, yeah, I got this deal off market, whisper, hush, hush, you know, let's see if we can do a deal. It's more, you have a seller that his NOI is not as strong as it was, let's say in January or February. He's nervous about putting it on the market because of liability. If we do showing, somebody gets COVID, yada, yada, you know, how are we gonna handle that? Goes under contract, how do we handle showings that way with inspectors and third parties? So there's a lot of that going on. So. The, the conversations are like, you know, hey, yeah, we would like to put it on the market for whatever reason, but right now, it's, it, for us internally as a seller, it's not the right time, but go talk to 20 people or 30 people that you know would take a hard look at it, you know, sign a CA, uh, run to write the numbers and make an offer. So we've seen a lot of that going on in the A, B, and C product, um, and deals are still getting done that way. Uh, and just like Jacob and Nick had mentioned, we just haven't seen that COVID correction and, and it just it hasn't come. And I think a lot of people early on were surprised that their rents and their occupancies and, and collections held up in, in April and May. And then I've got to put you know, my, my caveat on there, you know, we could still see a COVID resurgence. And like Jacob said, and Nick said, there's an election coming. And you know, the way Washington DC works, you know, the stimulus package, are we gonna see you know, payroll adjustments, or we're going to see, you know, some sort of weekly, just automatic three, four, six hundred dollar uh, a, a week check be mailed to people that make less than a hundred thousand. Are we still going to see that? What's going to happen after the election? Nobody's trying to get reelected right then. That all could dry up or or it continues. So there's still a lot of uncertainty, but that's that that's my story, and and hopefully it's been informative. You know, to me, I want to hear deal stories. Tell me it can be the worst freaking deal that's happened in the last six months or the best deal. And, um, you know, say what you need to say, but the, the goal is I want these guys to learn how to be better buyers and sellers. And so if there's a deal story and a lesson, that would be great. So that's, that was the first question. So yeah. you guys want to try that out? Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll go first with one uh, that I thought was interesting. So 
So we had uh, a deal, a large deal. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were in escrow. Uh, deal fell apart. The, the, the buyer had a really interesting kind of unique debt program that he was doing with a, a kind of a close relationship. It's about a $40 million deal. And um, he, uh, that dried up and he's like, well, the deal doesn't make sense at my pricing. I'm gonna drop the deal. So he dropped the deal. Um, we waited till, you know, we got a little deeper. Everybody kind of felt a little more certain about the operations. And we got a call from uh, some of our counterparts in our Palo Alto office. And they said, hey, um, you know, we've got this uh, guy that we've worked with quite a bit in the past. He owns no apartments in Texas, um, extreme high net worth individual looking to get out of the West Coast and put some money into Texas. And, um, you know, do you have anything that, that we could show the guy? And we said, well, yeah, hey, we've got this deal. We're going to be bringing this one back out to market at some point in the next month or two. But, you know, he's welcome to look at it. So the guy comes, flies in, looks at the deal um, and just says, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, that looks good. I'll take that. And the guy literally is buying the deal for $39 million on a line of credit. He went hard with 500 K day one. Um, and it's, it's been about the quietest, smoothest, simplest transaction. I mean, we would have never known the guy if not for, you know, our, our counterparts uh, on the West coast. Uh, and again, they're getting, we're getting a lot of these calls right now more than ever before. Uh, you know, it's funny because even, you know, in 2004, 2005, you know, and, and you know, Chris and I were, were at the same spot at that time. Um, and, and it was like, man, it was all California guys coming into the market. And then, you know, thanks to a number of, for a number of reasons, uh, there's been a rise of, of local investors, like pretty much everybody in this room, who are now, you know, our deals are now, I would say in DFW, probably more likely to trade with somebody local. Um, this has been a real interesting shift to see here. And, and that's just one example. We're seeing it on multiple examples. And uh, I, I, I had another call uh, with a, a couple of a husband and wife the other day. They're uh, in their early 70s, lived in Newport Beach their entire life and own two deals out there and want to get it out of there and move it into Texas. And um, yeah, you know, Can I talk a little bit about yeah. that? How many people were on that Marcus and Milchev call last week? listening to what's going on with Proposition 21 in California. Did you guys listen to that at all? That is unbelievable about rent control, what's, what's going on. So people are gonna be leaving Northern California, Southern California in droves, their money. So people who've made, let's say in the last say 10, 15 years that have made some money on real estate in California, <clears throat> we have guys out of California, and I would probably imagine uh, Nick in uh, Jacob and Chris could help you kind of give them ideas about they're going to be bringing their money outside of California. But can you talk a little bit about Proposition 21 and John Sebring's comments and things last well, week? Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, I mean, it, you get the, the essential summary is, is really not much more than what Paul said. It's, just the, it's a terrible time to be a landlord in California. And, and everybody kind of knows that. But with rent control, and I mean, there, there are literally... There are stories that we hear of people having to pay a tenant who's lived rent free in a property for a year or two years. They'll pay them a hundred thousand dollars just to get out. I mean, after they've lived there for a couple of years, you know, I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's it's almost like mind blowing. And then when you have the government coming in uh, saying, hey, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, and these these a lot of these folks have just had enough. Yeah, a woman and, on this conference call says that, you know, her company owns 13,000 units up in Northern California, specifically in the Silicon Valley area, $600,000 value per unit, $600,000. She says if this thing gets approved or passed, she'll lose $200,000 worth of value to these properties. So if you've been watching, again, just like the guys that said, they're talking about people leaving California or are being displaced out of their jobs in uh, Silicon Valley, and now they can work out of their house. Why live in an area that's three or four, five thousand dollars a month when they can move to other areas of the country, keep that same job, and make that same amount of money, and maybe move to an area that's not charging state income tax, but because California is also raising 
under proposed, going from 13.3 up to 16.8 state income tax. And if you have $30 million or more, they're going to possibly charge you a wealth tax of 0.4%. Uh, so just to get into California yearly, you'd have to pay if you had a $30 million state, which that's just a couple of multifamily properties, really, you'd pay another $120,000, $140,000 just as welcome to California tax. And if you made your income in California and you were to leave and go to Texas, let's say, for 10 years, they'll claw back that wealth tax to you. So interesting things that are going on in California. People are starting to really pick up and, and start to, to think about where else they can invest. So that is going to be competition for us coming forward. So make sure you assemble your groups. And let's start <laughs> buying more stuff right now, by the way. So let's, kind of talk, let's talk a little bit more about just like in the vein of what James asked, any some success stories, structuring. Jacob, uh, the old man from the sea, what's the question? <laughs> He's got a mic. He's got a mic. Yeah, I got, I, I got double mic now. Well, just, just don't forget, California is still beautiful. So, hey, go visit. <laughs> don't, um, don't live there, though. <laughs> so I want to start, like Nick, case study. You know, I think we all have in our roles, we, 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 we have our kind of uh, formats and expectations of going forward. And I mentioned a deal. We had a deal that was set to close mid-March. It was all teed up. It literally just needed the, the, the Fed numbers and a signature, and it was a done deal. We, we're not in the business of jinxing jinx ourselves, and we know that a deal is not done until it's done. But at that time, you think, okay, we, we are home free, we are good. Now, that deal cost uh, some, some rip pants because I fell to my knees and thought, well, what do I do now? Is this, should I just give up? Now, we're in a business where that is not a good way of handling it, so you gotta get back on it. And like Nick said, hey, there's always another angle, you know, and we spent a little time after when it, this hit, figuring out the angles and, and kept pushing. Now, you are seeing, like, like Chris mentioned, we are seeing these funds that sits with a ton of money. Maybe they have just been looking at Class A deals. Now they're looking at affordable uh, deals because that they, they can see where the world is kind of going and what the needs are gonna be. And now they're coming in from a completely, a, a group that wouldn't have looked at in the past they're coming in and say, that's an excellent match for us. Now, going through that, um, I, I think we had to rework our book a little bit on, 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 on how to get it done. It was a new day one of how to take a deal down. You have to be, again, sensitive to how, how we can get into the units. How, what can we look at? How can we do these things? Can lenders fly in? Um, so, but we worked through it. And that's the one thing I would say when we met, when we were talking about being a better buyer. I think it's about continuing to reinvent yourself. Be in tune with the market. If, if you hear something, and, and, and I've gotten a lot of calls with pe people saying, well, this is, um, this is tough times, and I'm gonna buy 60 cents of the dollar, and I'm saying, good luck, you know, that I can't help you. Um, and we are seeing those trends. That is not something that's working if, if you're looking at the buyer side. I think it's about constantly educating yourself be in a active conversation of attacking these issues, the physical issues of getting on site or whatever that may be um, to, to, to get the deal structured. And uh, not just blanket, now we need a year to close the deal. I think that's a bad idea to take that approach. Um, so now this deal is, is set and it should close this, this month here and everything is good. And we found the path and I would encourage all you guys also to find that new path, the tweak path to going forward. Chris? Uh, so I guess my case study would be uh, post-COVID, that kind of stuff. We were talking about different, uh, different industries uh, focusing on multifamily. We had a, ho a hotel investor that before COVID, he owns 29 hotels, kind of all in the greater south southwest area. They're all flagged hotels. And he had been kind of talking to us, you know, casually, I need to get into multifamily. I need to get into multifamily, all that stuff. Well, all of a sudden we, we market a deal over in Euless and he makes an offer. So we talked to him, he goes, well, I, I need, I have to get serious because pretty much within a week, all my hotels went from 98 on average occupancy to five. And he says I, that, I mean, everything just kind of dried up. We don't know about when everybody's gonna be coming back. So we're coming in. That's half the story. So the other half is there were multiple offers on the deal and he didn't own any single, he didn't own any multifamily, didn't own any, at all, um, claimed to have a lot of 
high net worth and, and, and equity. Uh, or we had a, the, kind of the second place offer was a very well seasoned purchaser. He was putting up hundreds of thousands of dollars hard day one, wanted the deal, everything. The only difference was about, um, the difference was about $800,000 in price. And um, I mean, just from, a buyer, from James's comment on what you guys wanted to hear, that buyer, the second place buyer, kind of stuck to his guns and, and he came in and said, look, we own multifamily. Here's, here's um, please call this lender, please call this seller. Uh, we've toured it, all the decision makers have toured it. Um, we, used, we, we own kind of in the immediate submarket area. I mean, they had all their ducks lined up in a row. And so uh, when we took those two offers to the seller, you know, he kind of asked us, which one would you take? And we, you know, knowing his background and why he was selling and, and this kind of stuff, he, you know, we said, hey, look, I mean, if, if, if somebody can't close the deal, then, you know, there, there's no deal. There, nobody makes any money anywhere. So um, he was influenced and he, and he took that, that lower priced offer and we're in a contract and everything's, everything's going smoothly. But I think at some point you, you kind of have to still a little bit like what Jacob, I guess, going against Jacob's comment, but if, if you still stick to your guns a little bit and say, hey, look, you know, my underwriting is sound. Here's what I own. Here's old capitals loan quote. Um, you know, I've got everything lined up. Here's my offer. And, you know, but keep that conversation going and keep it loose and fluid. But at the same point, you know, stick to your guns a little bit because it, it's still, even in this COVID environment, I mean, the numbers still have to work. Your, your returns have to work and that kind of stuff. All right. I got one more. Um, for you guys, and then I'll open it up. So have your questions ready. Um, so we got three guys here, and we got three classes of multifamily, class A, B, and C. Whoever wants to go first, they take class A, give me all your pros, all your cons of investing in that asset type, and the next guy has got to take the other two. Each one's going down. So whoever wants to go first, because a lot of people in this market, everybody in this room right here, they usually started with C, they maybe moved up to B, and now we're seeing some people do development A stuff. And the same way Chris was saying, people are going up and down the spectrum right now. And I think there's pros and cons in all three, but I just wanna hear from your side, if you're out there and you got an A deal, how are you raising equity for that deal and sort of mitigating that? So whoever wants to kick it off, they get their choice of whatever asset type, and then the other two, you gotta figure it out from there. I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> um, so what's your what, yeah, what's yeah, let me let me think now that I got that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the buzzer. It's like the Jeopardy yeah, yeah, yeah. buzzer. Yep. No whammies. Um, so I, B, I, I, or I, I, I'll define B as kind of that 80s, 90s vintage. Um, I, I would define that also, I guess, as a, as a uh, eight foot ceilings. So I wouldn't I wouldn't do the I would take nine foot ceilings as more of, of an A-class range. So in my head, I'm thinking eight foot ceilings, just so everybody is on the same page. Um, I think going forward, I think that's, that's where your value add is gonna be. Obviously, they're pitched roof, individually metered. Um, they're gonna be in decent or good school districts, uh, solid submarkets. Um, so I think your long-term hold on that kind of product is, is probably a good investment, but that's also where you're going to have still the most value add. I think if you went a little more to the A, you know your 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 competition's going to be a little different. Their cap rates are going to be a little more aggressive, and I think the, the that value add opportunity is not going to be as as good. Um, what's so, the what's the downside of B right now? Downside of B, I, I think they're just getting dated. Um, it, I mean. It, and I guess the range on, on in my, you know, if we're thinking of 80s vintage, there's 80s vintage in South Dallas and, and the ISD school district, and then there's 80s vintage in Plano ISD and, and you know, strong rents. So there's a wide range. And I think, you know, as the downside goes, you know, been doing it as long as I have. I mean, 80s vintage at some point is gonna be C product and it's gonna be older and, you know, the new class A is gonna be more dynamic and vibrant and, and, and something will be new and, and exclusive for that. So it'll, it'll just shift on down, but yeah. there's, there's not much downside in my opinion, but, but I'm, I'm defending my, uh, 
<laughs> your position. My big position. I got it. Yeah. All right, Jacob, Nick, what do you got? Well, <laughs> take the A. I'll okay. take whichever. Okay. So the A space, I think that's that's the that's the space where there's been a little bit more versatility, and that's because you can replicate it today. You have let's let's say you have 100,000 units, and next year's pipeline is 45,000, and next year's could be 50,000. We don't know. So B, C, you can't really replicate it. It is what it is. You know what you have of quantity, and 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 um, uh, yeah. Again, you can't you can't replicate. So. That's a little bit the downside because what we've seen in Dallas Fort Worth, there have been, um, even though developers are typically very smart, they, it's still a herd mentality. So you go up and down the 75 corridor in the uptown market, and now it's on the other side in, in East Dallas. Uh, you see one um, developer starting in one corner, now you're seeing three, four, five, six right around. And now you have suddenly four deals on each corner opening their doors at the same time, competing for the same tenants, and, and, uh, the, and, the, and the locators, they have a feast because they have the tenant's information, and when the lease is up in 12 months, they will send it on and say, look, I got a deal for you, you just need to move your couch across the street, and I'll give you two months free. All right, so that's really the downside right now when you are building, you're not protected the same way as a Class B asset or C asset, where that's not gonna happen down the street, it is what it is. Now, having said that, I think the Bs, especially good locations, the pricing of Bs, they have really pushed up. Now, now it's norm and you're seeing in good areas that you're seeing 150, 160, 180 K sometimes for a class B unit. And then you go down and say, okay, well you can actually go in and buy a class A unit for maybe 20, 40,000 more a door. And it might make sense not to have the same expenses on, on maintenance on the deal. And that's probably the upside. And what we have seen is we have seen a tick up with guys maturing, starting mid class, class, class C. There's one group here in Texas or in Dallas that's been extremely um, um, uh, good at, at, at climbing the ladder called Nightvest. They started with a class C asset in, in Fair Park, and now they're buying a bunch of class A's. And that's that's kind of that, that's what they're focused on now. Uh, so. I think the Class A here in Texas, uh, we, there are some that are struggling. You have to be, you, you, you need to know what you're doing. It's not that easy just to go in and, and buy one. You need to understand uh, the amount of um, free rent that's provided, gift cards and whatnot. But I think the upside is you're sitting 2020 and you're buying a 2015 asset. Um, it's, it's obviously newer construction is gonna hold longer. So that's, uh, we're seeing a lot of funds coming uh, in and, 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 and buying some of these and also uh, smaller uh, high net worth individual family offices uh, not to make value add money and, and say well we're going to exit this in 24 months but looking at it on a longer range it might be 10 years 15 years something, something like that. Nick, Class C. Yeah I mean you know I think Class C at the end of the day if, if dollars are tight economy's tight you know it's affordable and so that that always would give me comfort um, you know no matter what you're always gonna have people that are looking to uh, to save money I mean, that's gonna be a significant segment of the population um, if we ever got to a time where you, you know you wanted to you, you felt the demand was going into the nicer assets you can always upgrade and improve a property and, and you know we've all seen owners who have taken older properties and you just kind of been wowed by what they've been able to do. So I just feel like that gives you a level of comfort, um, you know, that you don't always get uh, in the A and B space, you know, when you're paying higher price per, per unit, um, you know, it could, it could be a little nerve wracking when, you know, the market gets tight um, and uh, the numbers and rental rates and all that start, start coming down. Um, I think when the economy's good, um, you know, obviously maybe some people will, will stretch and go live in a nicer place, but, but, um, but I think when the economy is hurting, you're going to really be in, in good position uh, in the Class C realm. And, and again, from an investor standpoint, you know, uh, just a lower basis is, makes it harder to to get hurt. Um, you know, the deals that I've generally seen where where people have have, have been hurt, maybe they had a, a higher basis than what um, than maybe what they should have. So uh, I'd say uh, physically, from a downside. You know, really, even just like some of the '80s stuff, 
you know, you have some obsolete floor plans sometimes, or just certain elements of, of those units that make them less attractive, um, which make them harder to rent maybe. Um, you know, sometimes locations of, you know, of course everybody says, well, I love the class C deal in a class A location. That just <laughs> doesn't generally happen. There's just not a lot of class C deals in, in class A locations. So a lot of times the location is, is not ideal um, or, or not as good as, as maybe some of the B and C deals. And then I would just say the last part is just mechanically, you know, you, uh, you, I mean, certainly you can fix plumbing lines and, and all the stuff underground, but uh, if you're a long-term holder of real estate, a Class C deal is hard to hold because, you know, it's, it's capital intensive. And so if you're in and out in four or five years, you can infuse a bunch of capital in it. That's all going below the line, grow your NOI. Um, but if you're going to hold forever, you know, or 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, then Sometimes uh, that could be problematic. The older you get, you're just gonna, it's just gonna cost more. The residents are gonna be harder on the units, the, the mechanical and operations, everything's just, just more expensive. So we're gonna open it up to questions. You know, we just heard from the, the boys about class A, B, and C, but I really wanna talk with, this is totally off the cuff, with the guy who's just, is in the process of building something with his partner, Michael Walker, over here. Why did you decide to build an apartment complex? And for your first deal that you built, how big was it? Right, my name's Lane, and I'm with Tyler Lakes and Michael and Parker. So we have a development project just outside of Austin, Texas. It's co-located with an opportunity zone. And so several years ago, we were looking, our strike zone is value added. And we were looking at value adds in North Texas. That's where we were comfortable. That's the strategy we had demonstrated successfully several times, but we just couldn't find it. We could find value adds, but we were the backside of the value. We had to buy a project at market pricing and then come in and cap exit, and it just didn't make sense. And so we thought, what is the go-ahead strategy for the next couple of years? And so we looked at opportunity zones. That's when they just came out. And we said, how can we couple opportunity zones with an existing project and you really can't do that. It has to be an opportunity zone with a development project. And so we looked at development and we looked at all the opportunity zones across Texas and most of them aren't worth investing in. There's no financial investment incentive, but some of them are. And we selected Austin. It's a 320 unit project and we're building all in at Austin at about $150,000 per unit, brand new construction, A class, 320 units. We're buying in Austin. We're not buying, we're trying to buy in Austin at 165. That's the whisper price. And so we're building brand new at a substantially less value than we're buying a 15 year old project in Austin. And the numbers just make sense. Development doesn't make sense in most areas, but in Austin and with high rents, you can do both. And how far is that new Tesla plant away from uh, you guys? <laughs> So luckily, after we did that, Tesla builds about seven miles just south of us. And so they're bringing 7,000 new jobs. And you saw what Austin's in the top market there. So it's a really explosive area. We just got lucky, I guess. Maybe not lucky, but just trying to look, look forward and trying to find out where the trend's coming. Better to be lucky than good. So thank you. So any questions? I'll, I'll ask a question for this, this group over here. When we're thinking about making an offer, do we want to make sure that we have a physical contingency in the transaction? We want to make sure that we want to see the property before we go under contract between the LOI and the PSA. What, are your, what is your take these days? Can we get physically on the property to do a little due diligence before we go hard with three, dollars $400,000? What, what extent are you talking about? Like a tour or like? Well, no. So we've, I'll let you we've, do a tour. we've, get, we've <laughs> been we've been uh, awarded the deal. The LOI has been signed by the seller, but in this, but let's say we haven't been awarded the deal. But let's say it's one of the things that we want to be in the property for forty eight hours to do some physical, take a look at the roof, take a look at the plumbing, making sure that the, the property is in good shape before we do it. What are you seeing right now from? Sellers, are they, what are they saying right now? Is it something that's out there, Chris? Um, 
so I'm, we're doing a deal in, in, with somebody right now in, the, in this room where, and it, and it seems to be a very seller, we've done it multiple times and the sellers seem very flexible with it. We, we've, in the past, our seller has been burned where we, okay, we have an agreed upon letter of intent. Okay, we're negotiating the contract. Uh, we'll give you guys an access agreement. Well, that contract negotiation goes on for two, three weeks. And so they've had literally kind of this free look at the property. So what we've been implementing and the sellers seem to like that is um, we go under contract, but we just give them, let's say a three or four day window, their money goes hard on day four, let's say. And the sellers, especially in this COVID environment, this, um, there's been very little pushback from our sellers saying, yeah, we get it. You know, we want hard money day one. I understand that. But, you know, if they've only toured two units, you know, in this COVID environment, you know, I get that. If they want to go in and see all the vacants, walk, you know, look at the boilers and, and look at all the, the common areas, then on day four, their money goes hard. Okay, agreed to. That's, we've, we've had that multiple times. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say an access agreement is, is, at least for any occupied units, is probably a non-starter right now. You just don't want to disrupt the residents unless you know you have a deal. Uh, vacant units would be great and uh, you know I think it all depends on the seller it probably depends on the the activity on the deal like you know where the leverage probably falls right if you've got 20 people that are dying to buy the deal then you could probably be a little more choosy as to what you're gonna let someone do if um, and you know and, and and look if the roof is good and the plumbing is good then you may just say yeah go for it you know that that's but I would say anything that's invasive and bothering residents, staff right now, I think people would be very, very hesitant. Now more than ever, we wanna get it right on the first the first time. And, and when historically we do, but obviously you just don't want a deal to fall out and then have to go back and contract three weeks later and and walk all the units again. I mean, that would, that would not be a, a good situation in the environment. I'm very excited about having you add some more people to your team in different areas of the country. Can you give me three or four of the cities you guys are gonna be pursuing with the new team? Yeah, um, I, I would say if you drew um, a map as far east as say Jackson, Mississippi, um, all the way up to Omaha, Nebraska, uh, which would include Little Rock, uh, you know, different cities in Arkansas, uh, Wichita, Kansas, Kansas City, Des Moines, uh, you know, Omaha, down to you know, Santa Fe, Albuquerque. Um, those are all markets that, that we are, are eager to cover. We've done deals in a lot of these markets. We just have never kind of been intentional about doing deals. We've had clients that have asked us to do deals there. Um, but I think what we've seen in some of those deals is A, there's a, there's a big demand for it. B, you can buy deals at higher cap rates at a lower basis. And, and these are big cities. A lot of them are pretty good sized cities. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the drivers, they may not have the, the explosive rent growth that you're gonna see in, in, in various parts of the country, but with rates where they are now, if you can buy a deal that's at a good cap rate, at a good basis, that hasn't had a whole lot of upgrading done, then you know, feels like a pretty feels like a pretty good opportunity. Oklahoma is in that in that mix as well. So anything inside those lines that I was just drawing there, Louisiana would would be in there. Um, you know, and then too. I'll stop asking the questions, but but uh, Jacob, secondary markets for you guys. How's everything out in Midland, Odessa? Great. For your team. Great, great. It's not so great. Uh, <laughs> uh, Midland Odessa is it, it is a good market. It's a it's a high volume market when oil is right. Uh, I mean, I've never been to a place before when you get out and and you thought, well, sure, I can rent a car. No, you can't. Uh, I didn't make a booking two weeks before. There's no hotel rooms to be had. There are white trucks everywhere. Um, uh, we have, we have worked on several new construction deals. There was a huge demand to just get more units out there. People would sleep basically in, in, in containers. And the problem with it out there is it takes maybe 18 months to build a, a regular multifamily deal here. Out there it would take 24, 36 months because the truckers, they got pulled over by, by the oil companies. And now you work for me, 50,000 in your pocket and let's go. And then they would leave the load of, of, of uh, materials on the, on the side. Jeez. So that's the market, that's the upside in that market, which is very, very intriguing. The downside is you're betting 100% on a barrel of oil. And when the oil is down, uh, we are so fortunate here in DFW, we, are, uh, we, we, we 
we were not that oil related in comparison to like Houston, for example, but out there it's pure. So when the oil goes down and we're li looking at $35, 45, and I think that was the time late earlier, they would pay you to hold oil uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, then it's, it's, it's tough. It's really, really tough because they pull out quick and, um, and uh, the, the market is, it gets soft. Uh, when things are good, you can get for a Class C uh, unit out there, nothing special. You're getting $1,500, $1,800 in rent, and now suddenly your deal is, is on, on 100000 the door. It's, it's, it's a 10 cap. So that's the give and take with that market. It, it fluctuates. Um, it's starting to stabilize a little bit now since our last uh, turn down on the oil. Um, but um, we're not seeing a, a huge amount of... Uh, of, um, of things right now. Is there any questions? Gentlemen? Looks like James had something he wanted to yeah. <laughs> So, So your, your range, the range is not, was not five, six, seven. It was five, five and a half, and six. And now it's, it's slid down. I would say it's four and a half, five, five and a half now. ABC, NDFW on cap rates. And that's sort of what guys are whispering, I would think. Um, and I would say, well, everyone's whisper is four and a half on cap rate at the beginning. But you guys go ahead. That's my thought. That's what <laughs> I'm saying. Then we get softer after that, <laughs> slowly. I think a lot of it has to do with, with each investor, how much they're willing to put down to. I, I think the debt service is a big influencer on, on you know, cap rates, um, what kind of returns can we get? What kind of equity are we gonna bring to the table? What's our stack look like, our equity stack? Um, because especially with, with COVID and, and the COVID reserves, uh, you know, if you can put a lot more money down and be at 55, 60% LTV, then those reserves shrink and that you know, helps offset your returns or your IRRs, I guess, um, going forward. So, I mean, that, I would defer that almost to a, a debt question in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say the way I, I look at cap rates is the, the the relevance of a going in cap rate, in my opinion, is is can I get the debt that I want? And aside from that, I really don't care that much about it because I I really focus more on what's my business plan, right? So can I can I grow rents across the board, fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks? How much do I have to spend to get that? Um, I think as long as people are realistic and and savvy. Uh, with what their reversion cap rate is. I mean, I think that's probably more relevant actually than the going in cap rate is. Because mm -hmm. um, if you're saying, I'm gonna buy it at a four and a half cap, and I'm gonna do all this work, and then I'm gonna turn around and sell it at a four and a half cap. Well, and then my numbers barely work. You know, yeah, you're, you're asking for, for trouble if that's your, that's your underwriting you know, uh, mindset. I know a lot of people in this room uh, that that's always the, uh, that's, a, that's a controversial topic in the syndicating world is what's the reversion cap rate? What can I use to underwrite this? Is it seven? No, it should be six and a half. Well, no, I think it should be five and a half. I mean, right. There, there's a, so many variables there. Um, I also think people are, are sometimes if you spend a lot of money improving, a problem, well, that reversion cap rate might, might be a little lower. You might've increased the asset class of that property or how investors would perceive that. So I, 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 I think, it, it is, it's an interesting time because on one hand, you've got record low rates, which in theory should mean you could pay a lower cap rate and still get really good returns. But we also talked about there being sort of flat rent growth in the near term, right? So you, you better be able to figure out how to grow that NOI in some capacity. And then, and then obviously, you know, what are they going to be two years from now, four years from now, six years from now? We don't know. I would venture to say they're going to be higher than what they are today. A seven cap. I haven't seen a seven cap, and I don't know how long, though. I mean, that seems very, very high. And I will say that Marks and Millichap, we would do leading up to our conference every year for the last probably seven years. We've done that survey that we've asked a lot of, you know, a lot of you have, have, have been kind of verbally asked this survey before, but what's your biggest concern with your real estate holdings? And the, and the answers were, rising interest rates, you know, operating expenses, you know, all these different, it didn't really matter. Rising interest rates was always the answer. Uh, and it's no longer the answer. Property taxes, 
rising operating expenses, insurance, all are, are, are thought of as, as higher risk uh, or bigger risk to operators moving forward. But it, we literally had probably five years in a row where rising interest rates were the answer. And then finally everybody's like, well, gosh, interest rates are lower now than they were five years ago whenever I was answering that. Is, so I, I, would, I would say, um, A, I wouldn't dramatic over the next however many years. Um, you know, but but B, just be very cautious on the back end with with what your business plan is and what that reversion cap rate would look like. Yeah, I would, I would kind of second that. And, and when you're talking about cap rates, uh, a lot of it is like the going in cap rate. What What is the going in cap rate? I see it as just one piece of the puzzle. And I think you need to obviously hold that since that's going to dictate a lot of your capital stack. But it's also important to look at your business plan, how you're going to exercise, and that's where the reversion cap rate comes in. And that's your reversion cap rate. It's not what a, anyone else is putting in because you control your budget there. So I think you're going to see some of the best deals I've sold. It's a three cap, two cap. And that is because it is that gem that's a class C asset in a class A location. And um, it seemed like there was a huge overpay on that type of cash flow. But it was just one piece of the puzzle. When you actually look at the reversion cap rate, now you're looking at sitting on an asset that's, you know, you're going in a two and now you're suddenly at a seven uh, or, or a 10. And the purchase price, let's say, is 50,000 now, uh, it's, it's 100,000. So I think it's, it's all about like being um, not overwhelmed one stat, but look at, at it one, how does it work for my setup, my execution? And, and take that into account. Now, we're sitting, we've been sitting a long time, fours, fives in general, um, I see that staying probably the same. I don't think we're gonna be suddenly a three cap, cap rate uh, area, uh, then the money will seep other, to other locations where you can get better deals. Um, so, but, but the reversion caps here, I don't see them either being seven. I and mean, if you underwrite to that, um, you, you, you're probably not going to get the deal. Just two comments. Um, so the Fed last week sort of changed their inflation targeting. Um, so as soon as they saw uh, 2%, they were going to start rate hiking. But now they've changed it to an average. And so what that means is essentially that once it hits 2%, they're not going to do anything. It's going to have to go to 4%, and that average is 2%, and then they're going to start rate hiking. And so when you look at, when you do a floating rate loan now, and you go out and buy an interest rate cap, let's say on LIBOR, so LIBOR right now is 20 basis points. They're not projecting until 2027, so seven years from now, that LIBOR is hitting 1% right now. So they're thinking that LIBOR curve is essentially very flat, if anything. And so it's very cheap to buy an interest rate cap. Go ahead, Ajay. So let me just repeat that for everyone. Um, so secondary tertiary market, what should we be focused on in terms of uh, medium household income? How, how do we evaluate that market? And then also sort of what, how much more of a cap rate premium should we get in that market compared to if we just buy in DFW? That's just, uh, it's not a market necessarily anybody's ever woken up and said, hey, I'm dying to be in what in Oklahoma. Um, however, when you drive up to the market, um, this particular deal is, the uh, median household income is over 50K. Um, the average unit size is 900 square feet, over 900 square feet, like 920. It's in a, so it's in a good location. There's not a lot of competition. And um, it's, it could be bought, you know, it's under contract for 35,000 a unit. Average in place rents are $675 per unit. Right, so if, if you had a deal in Dallas, the average in place rents were 675 a unit, and that's low, by the way, that, that's lower than the competition. But if you had that in Dallas, that's probably a 70,000 a year. I mean, it's double, you know, that kind of pricing. That deal that was on the market, and we, we had a handful of offers, I guess, over time. That was a pre COVID deal, and then it was, a, it was but the, the debt was challenging on that one. So, uh, and some of the some of these markets are pre-review markets. Some of these deals you can't put an agency loan in day one, so that's maybe a barrier. But most most of them you can. Um, that just gives you an idea of, of the kind of metrics on a real-time example of one one that we have now. Um, and so I think that the theory as a as a prospective investor in this room and and why I would say hey you should you should at least be considering some of these deals is when that deal 
when we go to sell that deal down the road, somebody that's in Dallas right now is likely to be the buyer for that. They're going to say, well, wait a minute, I can go buy that deal at a, say it was a six and a half cap, you know, I mean, that's considerably higher. It's probably a hundred basis points higher than, and by the way, it's pitched roof, individual HVAC, individual hot water heaters, right? So all the attributes that you would like, um, literally across the board, other than it wasn't being managed very well and, and the debt wasn't very good. But, but if it was, it's not hard to look out in, in the future and say, okay, I, I build sell for 65,000 a door and two or three years. Um, so it's just hard to find those deltas in Dallas, you know, where you, you feel like you can turn around and, and sell something for a 20, 30,000 a unit, um, you know, uh, premium in, in a fairly short period of time. Um, so I, I would just say that's just a real time, you know, not a huge deal, five and a half, $5.6 million uh, asset um, in, in one particular market. But I think in general, that set of parameters is what you're going to find. A lot of times the household incomes better than what you'd find even in DFW. And, and, and honestly, the biggest reason for that is because it just means there's not a lot of apartments all around it, right? Normally when you see big median household incomes, it's because it's generally in a more residential area. There's not as many other competitors around it is, is generally. So, um, so that's, that's just, uh, that's just one, one example. I don't know, Jacob, you might have something to add to that. Yeah, I, I think uh, now I have some time to think about it. Yeah, there you uh, go. I would say if I should just put a number on it, 50 to 150 basis points, period. Uh, now there are always outliers. Now I talked about Midland Odessa. Uh, we run into another issue there. We have a new construction deal and uh, we put a six cab on it and it's 100, uh, 230, 240,000 at the worst. So now there's a question of the metrics. It's, it's not just the cap rate, it's about well, now I can go and build from ground up for let's call it 160, 170, that makes more sense. So there's another limitation to that that really comes in. It's not just a cap rate play or an argumentation. Uh, but I would say you can go to the Tylers, you can go to the Waco's, you can go, you know, Lubbock, Murillo, all these places. We're typically seeing that 50 to 150 basis points uh, spread. And I would say Midland Odessa, by the way, that we've we've run into the same problem. So that's probably the only market or, or all the oil markets, I should say. Uh, we, we actually <laughs> sold a deal last year in Hobbs, New Mexico, which most people here probably hadn't even heard of. Uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico, big oil and gas markets. They were actually bought by one of the largest owners in the country. The guy that bought it owns 60,000 units, all syndicated equity. I mean, all country club, mom and pop, you know, equity. He owns 60,000 plus units. He bought both those deals. Very big price per unit, long-term hold. Um, probably could have built them for cheaper than he bought them, but he has absolutely knocked them out of the park since he bought them. So, but I would say in general, outside the oil markets, generally you're gonna have a lower basis, though, though those markets are those markets are the exception. You can actually be paying a higher price per unit uh, than, than what you would uh, think seems rational. Mm -hmm. All right, Pratima. All right, based on the market right now and the data, and the data I think Nick, you also shared the cap basis spread becoming big. Are we seeing a shift in the market from sellers to buyers market, or is it is still pretty much a buyers market with a lot of hard money and stringent terms? Yeah, yes, we, we have not really seen a big shift there. Um, uh, I think, again, from what I've also heard these two other gentlemen have talked about, is the same picture we see. It's about the same terms. I, and again, small tweaks to the process, but overall, um, I think they, they also got hit by a lot of people, especially out of towners that that sees has been looking at Dallas for a long time and said, now it's the time, you know, now everything is on fire sale. Well, it's not, you know, and um, uh, so we are seeing this, the same type of situation more or less um, uh, than, than in the beginning of the year. I, I, the only thing I agree with Jacob, the only thing we're seeing a lot is now with LOIs and contracts is there's some sort of language in there you know, talking about COVID, hey, uh, close in 60 days, but uh, maybe two 15-day extensions. And then also, uh, you know, if any ramifications from COVID event occurs, um, you know, buyer and seller will discuss, you know, extending beyond that or something right. like that. Just 
you know, if, if there is some sort of shutdown again occurring like that. So we've seen that kind of language. Yeah, we, we had an LI yesterday that if there was a shelter in place or any type of state mandated uh, or, or, or locally mandated order that all the time frames in the contract would automatically extend by whatever the time period that the shelter in place went on. So that was just an automatic mechanism to, to give them some protection uh, in the event that it became hard to do due diligence or it became hard to get lenders out there or, or whatever. So that, that's what we've seen on that front, but I agree with these guys. Maybe, maybe assumptions, and, and I will say there's been a couple people that have said, hey, maybe that's a good business model is I can go in and buy some assumption deals right now and maybe get a better deal on those, you know, versus new, new debt, you know, deals. If, if you don't mind getting amortization, not having all that cash flow right away, a lot of times those deals are still just as viable. It's just, it's just not the way we're all conditioned to, to be evaluating deals. All of our investors want cash flow, you know, and they, they're not that excited of, of, of storing up all this uh, principal that they're going to get in five years. So, no. but that might be an opportunity. Chris, are you working out of your office? Jacob, are you working out of your office? In this is my office right now. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. Our, our office has been closed since March, uh, uh, what's that, 12th. So, and, and we, I mean, our key fobs don't work, nothing. So we have to, <laughs> if, if we need to get a file or something in there, we call ahead. Um, there's two people that get mail and things like that. They have to be there. Yes, confirmed. They meet you at the door. Everybody's masked. You walk in. You get what you need. Okay, see you, bye, and you leave. And and the earliest we, I think, there's like a committee or something. They're going to meet after Labor Day, and then some sort of documentation has to be done. And if that's approved, then we have two weeks. So the earliest we'll go back will be October 1st. We're, we're, we're open. Our office is open. Okay. Nobody knows there's a pandemic in our office. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Walker. What are the pros and cons of chasing tax credit deals right now? Has that changed? You, you know, I, we don't do a ton of them. Uh, we've run across a, a couple of them, but I, 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 I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to say too much about that. I know, I know we have a tax credit group in our firm uh, in Detroit, and those guys are doing very, very well right now, but, but I haven't run across any, any particular deals in that front. Same with us, we have our specialty group that takes care of the pure tax credit deal. So we don't, we help with tours when they're in Dallas and Fort Worth, but besides that, uh, it's the different metrics that most people are looking uh, at when, when we talk pure tax credit deals. Historically, a lot of those people who did tax credits actually went to jail. <laughs> That's very dangerous. Just a lot of bribery in that business. I've got a quick, quick question about the new um, evictions moratorium. So, for example, if you're under contract right now and and the sellers start having a lot of delinquencies, what do you think that, um, I guess, kind of what, what is your take on it? Because if, if you're wanting to have some kind of a stipulation that if, well, if delinquencies, you know, go to a certain point or something, it's somewhere along the line because it's going to affect your financing. So how do you see that from a representing the seller side? How can we work together? We've seen language on, on one or two deals where they said, hey, if you're uh, effective gross income, your effective your EGI has to be higher per month of whatever. Um, and then below that, uh, the seller will put up some, some monthly reserves, I think, to make that, that level, you know, that minimum, hit that minimum, I think. So they haven't really, they just kept it on a high level number. Hey, you know, you gotta be collecting X number each month or after that certain things will kick in and, and adjustments will occur. We have had a lot to, of, of those discussions on the execution side. We haven't really seen it being implemented. Um, talking to lenders, whatnot, there's a reason why uh, lenders, they want the escrow amounts right now. And there's a gap there for, you know, um, where, where that should go in and kind of kick in for those reasons. So that's kind of the tight end loop. So uh, what I think is important is to uh, have a very open discussion with the lender and make sure they understand as much as you going into this deal, hey, this is the, this is the P&L and this is, you know, we have X amount of, uh, you know, uh, units that have not paid and, and dive into it. So there's a roadmap uh, 
for for that coming up and we have started to see it now um, I, I think a lot of people have paid their rents uh, there there are still some people that that are under the impression that hey yeah, I'm, it's, this is free now everything is free and uh, um, you had to deal with that and the way I've seen it being done is like stay close to the lender understand that situation and uh, but that's that's the reason why uh, you have to escrow funds right now I mean, I think obviously what you were saying down yesterday, it may be a little too soon to tell. It's it's a great question because I, I think it's going to come into play. I think one thing we've seen throughout this whole thing is that leasing has remained really strong. So I think it really puts a pretty significant emphasis on qualifying residents in a way that may be even, even more uh, in depth than what, what you, you know, have maybe previously done. Um, you, you certainly, now's not a time to, roll the dice on on any resident that you know, you know they're borderline like you, you need to you know really tighten up the leasing criteria to make sure that any of these new folks coming in are mm -hmm. are going to pay so i i uh i don't know it's going to be a challenge it's it's going to be interesting to see i i still think you know we're going to have to have some i think we're going to see some sort of federal you know uh stimulus uh at some point but we can get you know everybody back in session and you know so we'll see. Uh, hopefully that's sooner rather than later. So when Darwin bought this property, and I'm going to tell <laughs> tales out of school, what did you negotiate, Darwin, with the seller on this property? I'll hold the microphone, sir. Okay. Well, we actually closed March 24th, and that was right after the shutdown. And we actually said, hey, we need a rent guarantee that we can collect rents over the next six months. And so the seller put up some money and the brokers put up some money in escrow to go ahead and cover any potential losses for six months. So they actually put that up and we're going through and any rent we don't collect, then we can go ahead and just draw on that escrow account. So just getting creative during this period of time. I think that's I think that's important. How would you compare uh, bigger deals versus smaller deals? Uh, when I say smaller deals, like you know below hundred or seventy five, you know from a perspective of individual pur purchases and small partnership groups, the big money is chasing the larger two hundred unit deals. Uh, but what's happening on the smaller deals? Are there opportunities, you know, cap rate spreads between, you know, uh, bigger and smaller properties? You know, what are you seeing within uh, DFW market? Well, I mean, we still see a ton of demand for for those those types of deals for sure. Um, you know, the uh, and a lot of these West Coast and East Coast buyers course you know we've we've all seen over the years somebody that'll sell a duplex in california and then they'll take that and buy 70 units or more depending on on what the cost of that is uh, so we're still seeing some of that you know people that are wanting to come here um some of them their first deal is is going to be a, a a 75 and under type deal uh, but I don't, I don't think there's a dramatic difference in the demand for the larger deals or the smaller deals i think we have pent up demand across the board um, so, I, I, and, the, and the debt is, is still very good for the, for the smaller assets. So, yeah, I mean, you know, smaller, the small balance Freddie is, is a good option for those. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's positive. I mean, thumbs up on that. You can, you can always find pros and cons, and I think it's, it's correct, a correct assessment. You, you do have groups that are active right now with a lot of money. And it doesn't make sense for them to go after a 75 unit deal. So on that side, that's 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 a good thing of focusing on those. Uh, on the flip side, uh, that is your 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 entry asset, and you are seeing a lot of people in times like this, you know, feeling very comfortable of raising smaller funds and to do something. Um, so by that, you you do, you are getting more activity on the smaller ones because they are just easier to do and. It's, it's you can overcome, you know, and raising a million, two million instead of you have to go out and do 20 million. Since I have the microphone, I'll ask the last question. So, you know, we're going through COVID times right now, and a lot of people can't make connections to the brokers. How are people that want to buy 200 unit buildings tapping you on the shoulder and say, look at me, look at me, look at me, give me that deal? How are they doing it these days? 
I mean, still the traditional way. I mean, it, it's, you know, email, text, conversations, that kind of stuff. Um, we, we get a lot of phone calls, and so if we've never talked to you, talked to that person before, whatever, um, it, it's got to be repetition, and it's got to be consistent. So, um, you know, somebody that's, because we, we, I get a lot of phone calls, and you talk to the guy once, and then you never, he ne he, you know, he, you never see his name again. He never buys anything. He never, never. And so all of a sudden, it's just okay. So it's hard for us to decipher, you know, who's real, who's not, who's got the money lined up, who, who's very experienced, that kind of stuff. So consistency is, is the name of the game, at least in my opinion. You know, I talk to you this month and I see you at, at events like this and then, um, you know, a happy hour here and a dinner there. And, you know, you're, you're, you're getting into the fabric of, of multifamily Dallas-Fort Worth community. And, and so it becomes, it becomes that, that investor becomes more real and, and and uh, workable, I guess. Yeah, I would agree. It's still phone. I would definitely not sit back and just say, okay, well, um, I'm sure someone will contact me. It, that's not our life either. So uh, I would definitely stay in tune with brokers, with uh, uh, lenders and whatnot via phone. I've also done a bunch of uh, Zoom calls and that might be, you have several several new guys coming in and they could be from New York and they have partners in California. We all get on a Zoom call, we sit and talk about it um, and we get a sense of the business plan. And uh, I think one of the important parts, uh, speaking of Lane, started as doing class C's. Now he's developing, looking at some of the class A's. Uh, got a call from him and saying, hey, you know, just want to inform you that this is what we're doing now and kind of updating his business plan, updating his profile. And I think that's extremely important. Um, uh, you know, if I'm busy, I'm not going to pick up my phone, uh, but otherwise I will. So you're not offending me by calling a few times and I would, I would definitely do that. Uh, stay after it. Nobody wants to talk to you. No, that's good. I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I know everybody in this room, so it's great. Well, let's to, make sure that we know everybody in this room right before we leave here. So we're going to do two things. I'm just going to hold the microphone. I want you to say who you are and what you're looking for. It, it may be the same answer for everybody, but we're just about to leave here. And then Nick has something to give away, and then James has uh, something to talk a little bit about the old capital. So just say hello. I'm, in, I'm Jeremy Thomason. Um, I am a syndicator. I'm also in the industry. I work at CoreLogic, and we control about 20% of the screening done in the United States. So if you are interested in well, how to prevent some of the problems that we were talking about, we ought to have a discussion. And I'm not trying to sell. I'm just trying to tell you that there's some really scary stuff out there that's about to happen related to people that can't pay rent. Uh, Gary and Heidi Young, uh, we use Jeremy's uh, product, uh, but we're looking for a class B and C value add like everyone else. Uh, Mike Marianne, uh, looking for 100 to 150 uh, units in DFW. Alec. Alex and Sharon Clark, uh, looking for uh, C and B, 150 plus uh, tertiary secondary markets. Perfect. What are you looking for? Carolyn Putney. Um, obviously, I'm a buyer's broker, so I'm looking for B and C all over. All right, Pratima and Bhuvan Sharma. We are also syndicators and looking for 200 plus doors. This lovely lady. I am uh, Vivian Williams, my husband and I, Cornell. Um, we are, um, I don't know what we're looking for yet. <laughs> we just bought, so um, he might say something totally different, but uh, probably B, B class um, in the DFW area. Satya Masina, I have uh, two tracks going on. Uh, I, I buy smaller deals for myself and, uh, you know, small partnership groups. And I'm also looking for uh, 200, uh, you know, between 150 to 200 plus units for syndication purposes. Okay. 
Michael Walker with Pilot Legacy. Um, we're opportunity buyers, so A, B, and C. Hi, Jackie Green. I'm with LS Realty Advisors, and I'm also buyer's rep, so I'm also looking for B and C class garden style for my clients. Hey, I'm William Hubbard. I actually work with Chris Dia over at CBRE on our investment sales team. Fantastic. Alan Beezer, looking for deals over 150 units that don't have any eviction moratoriums on them. Good luck. I guess I'll be the first one to say it. I'm looking for a 10 cap if y'all can find me one. <laughs> um, but uh, 150 units uh, and up. I'm looking to build some relationships with uh, everyone in this room. I'm looking to be in the business for a while. Nick, we want the 180 units in Arlington. <laughs> You've already spoken. Ajay Sharma, I'm founder of Amnext Reality. So we have deals here in Dallas uh, and Phoenix and also in uh, Georgia. And I'm looking for in all three markets. Uh, any deal, 10 million plus. Uh, that's my my main goal, OK? That sounds good, bud. Daniel? I'm Daniel Canterbury, a partner here with Elaine uh, and Donish Nassim. Uh, we own seven properties across DFW, Abilene, Houston. We're looking for typically things between 8 and 15 million, um, 70 units and up. Um, we're actually contemplating doing a more of a portfolio of maybe two or three properties in that range together for a larger buy. So, yeah, Alaid Villegas, um, partner with Daniel, um, with in, in Abundance Equity Partners. We're looking for 150 units and up, uh, BNC class vintage. Uh, we are uh, Ken and Wen Yu. Uh, we are full-time investors, and obviously, we're looking for next next deal. Uh, just want to thank you, Paul, for having a live event. This is this is great. So thank you. No problem. Thank you. I'm Lane Bean. I'm looking for mispriced assets. <laughs> Darwin German. I'm looking for anything that makes sense when tax adjusted. So that's, that's all I care about. And it doesn't matter on the size. Hi, uh, Mike Spots, looking really uh, B and A minus uh, class assets, 150 to 300. Okay, I'm Kevin Parrish, and my company is at best Department Community Investors, and we're looking for sub 200 unit deals, A, B, and C. What markets do you own? Uh, so he asked, what markets do we own in? Wichita Falls, East Texas, Longview, Tyler, and here in DFW. I'm Julian Alexander. I'm with Darwin German Real Estate, that knucklehead over there. I'm looking for a world piece of <laughs> COVID vaccine and a unicorn. Uh, but no, we're opportunity buyers. We're looking for A, B, and C, and that's it. Brian Sifford with 1791 Capital. We currently own up in Wichita Falls, Fort Worth, and Grand Prairie. Uh, as a syndicator, I'm looking for 200 plus units within two hours of DFW. As an IRO, I'm looking for 50 units within two to three hours of DFW, 50 to 75. Great. <clears throat> you guys remember all these names and what, they're, what they have on their wish list? <laughs> All right, James, talk a little bit about what we're going to do in October. Well, I appreciate you guys. Um, so we we couldn't do so. The past couple of years, we've had bigger conferences, five, six hundred people. Um, this year, obviously, we can't do that, so we're going to do everything virtual. Um, so we're going to have seven hours of speaking and seven hours of breakout rooms, and so that's going to be October twentieth and twenty first. If you haven't registered, just go to the website. But i um, excited. We're going to have Dots Hour sort of kick it off the day of. We have listing brokers, lenders. Um, we're going to have bring back the rocking chairs um, and have the rocking chair panel as well. And then um, we're having guys like Neil Bawa, Jeremy Roll, some guys that we normally couldn't 
fly in. Um, we're going to just have them virtually and have them come speak to us from California. We're going to have brokers from Atlanta and Phoenix and in different markets as well to give us a little flavor of what's going on out there. So any questions about that, let me know. And then if you've gone to previous ones, uh, our camera guy, Caleb's in the back uh, and we're doing like a little promo video uh, that'll go out next week. If you have 30 seconds about the conference, we'd love to capture it on camera. So. I brought uh, a couple of uh, four umbrellas here. I've been saving these for a rainy day. And, uh, but and so I've been just trying to figure out, uh, you know, who do I give them out to? So uh, the first one has to go to wind, you know, for, for, for Absolutely, so, wind. Yeah. There you go, Paul. You got to deliver them. All right. The, the second was my, my favorite mask uh, of the day, which is the, the Clarks here. There you go. Very nice, the Clarks. Oh man, this is like the Oscars here. It's great. Uh, the next one uh, was to Cornell and Vivian for socially distancing from each other, uh, which I, I love. There you go. And then uh, I had to, since my, my kids wear the buff, I, the last one's for Sifford, you know, because he's got the cool buff on. And, that's uh, that's that's what they wore at Pine Cove all summer. So, yeah. It does. If you, speech.